How can you go from a silver crown to a triple crown through the schoolboy wonder and the say hey kid, record breakers and broken barriers? Find out next on Hall of Fame Connections. Miguel Cabrera is one of the most outstanding hitters of all time. He's won four batting titles and two MVP awards. And in 2012's historic campaign, he led the league in batting average, home runs, and RBIs to earn the first Triple Crown since Carl Yastrzemski in 1967. As rare as it is to win a Triple Crown, there's one piece of royal headwear so unique it could only be worn by the Sultan of Swat, the Colossus of Clout, the Great Bambino. <laughs> I'm talking about George Herman, Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth was arguably the first celebrity of the mass media era. He was a movie star, a spokesperson, a newspaper columnist, and of course, a baseball player. Ruth shattered records on the diamond as he did in 1921 when he clubbed a whopping 59 home runs. To put that into perspective, that same season, the entire Red Sox team hit a total of 17. Ruth's adoring fans wanted to do something truly special to honor their hero, so they pitched in to gift a crown fit for the home run king. This magnificent sterling silver trophy is adorned with 59 miniature baseballs, one for each of his home runs that record season. The crown itself is engraved with King Ruth as a token of their esteem and in behalf of those whose names appear here on, this crown is presented to Babe Ruth, King of Swat. That's right, the fans bought the trophy themselves, and it was presented to Ruth after the 1921 World Series. It was a gift fit for a king or a babe, but it was bittersweet. The New York Yankees lost to the crosstown rival Giants in the Fall Classic, despite a brilliant pitching performance from yet another Hall of Famer. Wade Hoyt was one of the most dominant Yankees pitchers of the 1920s, earning 155 victories for the team in that decade. The schoolboy wonder was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 1969. While he's beloved as a pitcher, he might have been even more so as a broadcaster. For over two decades, Hoyt did play-by-play -play for the Cincinnati Reds. He also called the 1953 All-Star Game at Crosley Field, where Warren Spahn got the W for the National League. Stan Musial once joked that Warren Spahn would never get into Cooperstown because he'd never stop pitching. I never faced a hitter that didn't enjoy hitting against me. I want to lull him to sleep until I beat him. That's fine. Spahn's career spanned 21 seasons when he retired at the age of 44. His 363 victories are the most ever for a left-handed pitcher. But perhaps his most astounding performance might have actually been a loss. In what is often called the greatest game ever pitched, Spahn's Milwaukee Braves we're in San Francisco to take on Giants ace Juan Marichal on July 2nd, 1963. Alvin Dart was the manager and he wanted to take me out. So I say, Alvin, do you see that man on the mount? Well, that man is 42 years old. I'm only 22. And until that man stay on that mount, nobody gonna take me out of this game. <laughs> oh my God, that was, that was a no-no, you know, talking like that to the manager, you know. But he, he let me stay. Lucky enough, it's the 15 inning. I got one, two, three, came back to the dugout. I stopped for Willie May to come from center field. Touched me on the show, I said, Chico, uh, <laughs> I'm ready to go home now. I said, okay, let me see what I can do about it. He was the lead off by the, on that inning. The first pitch, he hit it out. Oh my God, I was in heaven. When I saw that ball leave in the park and, uh, and the Giants went one nothing. Willie Mays was amazing. He could do it all, run, catch, throw, and hit for both average and power. The Say Hey Kid might be the most complete player in the history of baseball. And in 1955, he played on what might be considered the greatest team in the history of baseball. In the 19th and 20th centuries, barnstorming was a term used when teams or players traveled the country or even the globe to stage exhibition games, oftentimes in small towns. In 1955, Willie Mays and Don Newcomb led a barnstorming tour with five other future Hall of Famers, including Ernie Banks, Roy Campanella, 
Larry Doby, Monty Irvin, and a fresh-faced 21-year-old from Mobile, Alabama, named Hank Aaron. How would Henry Aaron describe Henry Aaron's 715th home run? A swing, a long drive, way back, way back. It's gone! <laughs> it's gone! Right. 750! No doubt! No <laughs> doubt about it! Yeah! Serious, Joe, uh, after I hit the home run and uh, left the ballpark that night, talked to my wife for about an hour, you know, and she went up and went to bed, and I just got down on my knees and I prayed. I thank God the drama, the whole thing had just hit me then when I got home. Aaron finished his amazing career with 755 home runs and would be elected to the Hall of Fame in 1982. That same year, another legend would also receive his plaque. Frank Robinson was a hitting machine. He belted 586 home runs and drove in 1,812 runs over a 21-year career, and he is the only player in baseball history to win the MVP award in both the American and National Leagues. Perhaps his most historic accomplishment came toward the end of his playing career. Robinson became the first full-time black manager of an American League or National League team when at the age of 39, he was named player manager for the Cleveland Indians in 1975. 28 years after Jackie Robinson integrated the game and one year to the day after Hank Aaron broke Babe Ruth's home run record. In 1966, Frank Robinson captured baseball's triple crown, joining such all-time greats as Mickey Mantle, Ted Williams, Lou Gehrig, Rogers Hornsby, and Ty Cobb. 46 years later, Miguel Cabrera repeated the feat by finishing the season with a 330 batting average, 44 home runs, and 139 runs batted in for the Tigers. Frank Robinson attended the 2012 World Series in Detroit to recognize the accomplishment and present Cabrera with a crown of his own. Runs batted in became an official stat in 1920, and every single Triple Crown winner since that season has been inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame. So it looks pretty good for Miggy, <laughs> just saying. If you want to learn more about the people, places, and artifacts in this episode, go to BaseballHall.org, where you can plan your visit to the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum in Cooperstown, New York, and discover your own connections to the game. Thanks for watching. For more incredible stories, check out our after show, Hall of Fame Connections Extra Innings. And don't forget to subscribe. Blagada!